with me as we do our scripture reading, which comes from 1 Chronicles 19, 11 through 13, if you'll please read along with me. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Let's sing together, We Will Glorify. Children are dismissed for Children's Church as we welcome Pastor Jed Carey. Good morning. Uh, today we're going to talk about growing in God's glory. And in our text, uh, we're going to be looking at two different passages. We're going to be first looking at Exodus 34, 29 through 35. And then we're going to jump to the New Testament and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, as we look at this text in Exodus and in, go over your reading this week, there was a lot of debate why Moses covered his face, okay, with the veil. Why did he cover his face? He came out, he's glowing, and then afterward he covers his face when he's not around, when he's not talking with the people. And once he goes in and, he, and he, he's with God, he glows again, and he comes out, and he talks with the people, and then he covers his face. Now, Paul has an opinion on this, and I think I want to go with the Apostles Paul opinion on this, that he covered his face, be, face because the glory, or the glowingness diminished. It went away. He didn't glow the same. And he didn't glow the same. Why? Because he wasn't spending time with God. He wasn't in the presence of God. And I want to talk about how in the new covenant, the covenant that we live in now, we spend every moment of all being with God. I I just want you to think about that for one moment. You spend every moment of your being in the presence of God. Every moment. There's not a time that God is not with you. Moses meets God in a tent. 
at this point outside the camp because God won't have anything to do with the Israelites. Because remember what they do. He gave them the Ten Commandments and what they do. They broke the first two, didn't they? They made a golden calf and they started worshiping it. Right? I have went through the tabernacle and how that brings us and ushers us into the presence and how it's through the work of Christ that we come into the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we live in that presence day by day. The Holy Spirit indwells you. He empowers you. And we saw the tabernacle, but then this reading, you went through a bunch of reading about the tabernacle again this week. And it's in contrast. They got given the Ten Commandments, and they said, we'll do it, we'll keep them. And then they didn't. They got instructions for building the tabernacle. They, they learned a lesson. What did they do? They obeyed. It says they made it, or they built it. They put together the tabernacle, like God had told them to do. So in, obedience is an important part of growing in the glory of God, being in the glory of God. Because if we're not obedient, we grieve the Spirit of God, okay? We grieve the Spirit of God. Let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 34. We're starting starting in verse 29. That is Exodus chapter 34, starting in verse 29. Now Moses had been up on Mount Sinai the second time for 40 days and 40 nights. He went up there with the tablets that he had cut out again and recalved with the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments on them. I personally believe that those Ten Commandments on, uh, on both tablets, lots of times they would make two copies. So both tablets have ten, the ten, uh, ten Words or the Ten Commandments on them. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God so Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and behold the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him but Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken to him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see that the face of Moses See the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with him again, to speak with God again. This is Moses representing the people before God. Moses having a personal face, mouth to mouth, face to face relationship with God. And the million Israelites don't have that. But Moses does. He has that face-to-face relationship with God. And you can see how it's not only changing him on the inside, but it's transforming him on the outside. That face-to-face relationship. However, that face-to-face relationship with God isn't continual, is it? Moses is not spending 24-7 with God, is he? He, he, he goes into the tent, and then he leaves the tent. And as he's leaving the tent, he's leaving the presence of God. Therefore, his face diminishes. Sometimes we want to try to treat uh, our Bible study like that, our quiet time like that. It's coming into the presence of God, and I get all stoked up and stored up, and then I can go out and face the rest of my day. And that's not necessarily wrong, but we're forgetting one of the biggest important facts is that God is with us every moment of every day. One thing that is a good discipline to do is to practice God's presence, 
to acknowledge, to have a conversation ongoing with him as you go through your day. It also keeps you from sinning. Did you know that? If you're consciously thinking that God is right there with you, you're less likely to do things that don't honor him. You're more likely to watch how you speak and what you say. If God is not on your mind and if God's presence is not being recognized, then, well, you kind of do whatever you want. And when we do what we want, it's not really that good, is it? Moses has to go back into that tent every day. He has to spend that time with God. And when he's away from that tent, he's not with God. He's separate. The people of Israel, none of them have that kind of access to God. Every believer who confesses Jesus as Lord now has that kind of access to God. The Holy Spirit has been given to you. You are sealed with him. He lives within you. Within you. And we live by the Spirit, not by the letter. The Spirit who transforms, who changes us. Not by our own bootstraps, not by what we can do or what we can earn, but by the power of the Holy Spirit changing us and transforming us on the inside as we humble ourselves. Turn with me to first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul's writing to uh, the Corinthians. He's talking about... Uh, his status with them, um, it's like you would talk about your, our letter of recommendation, and that's what he's giving. You know, I'm, I'm valid is basically what he's saying. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? And then he says something very interesting to, to all of us. This is true for all of us. Paw Paw Bible Church. You are our letters of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Living epistles written upon the hearts to be known and read by Paw Paw community. Living in the presence of God, everywhere you go, you are the ambassador for God. He lives in you. Where you go, he goes. You are his temple. He is holy. He's made you holy. The areas you go to become holy when you declare his name. Each one of us have circles of influence. Each one of us are in different places. You know people I don't know. I know people you don't know. Actually, I probably don't. Well, I do, but not in this area. But But we each have different circles of influence. And each circle of influence, we bring God into that. We are living epistles, living letters to be read by all men. To shine to them. Now, it's not an outward shining like Moses had was accomplishing. Though sometimes I think some people do radiate love or radi- they were, we would use the person, well, you're just glowing. Verse 3 says, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. And we think of Jeremiah, we think of Ezekiel, he says, days are coming when I will give them a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone. 
And this is in contrast to the law. The law is over us. The law is given outside of us, and it tries to conform us from the outside. The Spirit is given to live within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us, changes us from the inside out. doesn't mean that there isn't any laws. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering. And there is no laws against those things. And if we practice those things, we humble ourselves before the Spirit in those things, then we won't break the laws and we'll actually conform to the law. But it's not an outward, it's an inward walk. And it's not of our own walk, it's not of our own merit, but of the Spirit. It's written by our, on our hearts to be read by all and you should and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human hearts. Such is the confidence that we may have through Christ toward God. This only confidence that we have is in Christ. The work that he did on the cross, the vindication of that work done through his resurrection, that sin and death has been conquered, that we are clothed in the righteousness of God. And that each day we are growing in the glory of God. In verse 5 it says, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. That he has declared us righteous in Christ. And he who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He has made each one of us sufficient to be ministers of this new covenant, to be preachers of the gospel, to be sharers of the gospel. Each one of you. It's not on your own merit. You say, well, I could never do that. Your life in its of itself, lived for Christ, is proclaiming the gospel. It's proclaiming God. Laura was sharing a couple uh, of this last week at Tuesday night Bible study, and then again at Wednesday night Bible study. She works with the VA. She works with veterans, and she's very passionate about that, um, and I, I honor that. Well, she went there, and she's helping with uh, an AA meeting for them, and she decides, well... We need to pray. I, I want to pray with these guys. So she puts out this little box, and she says, okay, if you have prayer requests, I'll pray for them. She's what? Living, being a living epistle. So she has this little box for them, and they start putting prayer requests. And, of course, we all know Laura is a prayer, don't we? I mean, Laura prays. And so she's praying for these vets. Well, of course, God starts walking in these vets' lives, and God starts answering prayer, and then the vets are like coming up to her and saying, we want to do a Bible study. She's like, okay, we'll do a Bible study. It's like three people. I can do that. Right? And so she starts this Bible study with them. And then the next thing you know, there's 25 people in this Bible study. 25 people in this Bible. And, and they keep telling the Lord, well, we don't know what it is about you, but, but you just... You're just so real, and we see God loves you. She's a living epistle, folks. In her circle of influence that she's in, she's living Christ. And it's not to her own merits. It's because of Christ living in her, the Spirit walking in her. And then some of them were like, oh, we want to come to your church. If, if you're this real, they got to be real too. She's like, you can't come to my church. <laughs> That's Laura, right? She's like, okay, okay, I, I, I can take, I think she holds four in our car. So she's like, I can take four. Well, five people say, well, we want to go. And so then, then they go to the, the, they go to the, the guy in charge, and they're like, hey, we want to uh, go to church, but can we use the VA van? And, and the guy's like, oh, uh, yeah, sure, why not? You can use the VA van. But, you know, that's five people. The van seats 14. Maybe we should put a sign-out sheet out. So they put a sign-up sheet. I guess they do everything sign-up at the VA. We try to do sign-up stuff, and 
It doesn't really work, does it? I don't know if we just don't think about signing up. Or, Anyways, I was quite amazed that they put the sign-up sheet up. So that, guess how many people signed up to come to church? 52 people signed up to come to church. What? And then she's asking me, can 52 people come to church? There's 52 people in this room right now, so if we put another 52 people, we got to put some chairs back there because we all have our personal space, right? We can't have that invaded. 50, I said, of course, let them come. Well, they did run into some Sam Foods, otherwise there would be 52 vets in the church building right now. Um, they couldn't get a bus driver. And then it's getting some attention, it's gaining traction, so now there's some opposition. Okay, there's some opposition people in the, in the, at the VA complaining about these other people who are expressing their spiritual and religious freedom. And so now there's a discussion on, can they do this? And so we need to be praying for this. Because wherever the Lord is working, Satan does oppose. But my point of all this is, is that each one of us within all contexts of our circles, our living epistles. Living for Christ. Being written out upon our hearts and it's changing us. It's changing the way we act. Dave, this morning, was an an example of a living epistle. He's showing, being vulnerable, showing how God is changing him and walking through him. how the Holy Spirit is working in his heart. And we are not sufficient in ourselves, are we? We are totally dependent upon the Spirit who is with us always, who is working in us every moment, even when we're not cooperating, even when we're throwing the tantrum. You ever throw tantrums? I throw tantrums once in a while. That classic two-year-old tantrum in my heart, in my head, you know, we get down and you're like, I don't know. Right? Let's be honest. We might not do that outwardly. And if you do, I guess you could, but but we do that in our hearts, don't we? Because we lose focus. We lose focus as what God is doing in our hearts. And our goals are not His goals. Maybe we, we buy into the lie of culture that says health, wealth, and prosperity are where it's at. Rather than our relationship with God is the ultimate. To be like Jesus is the ultimate. Or we forget that we live in a fallen world and we're like, why me? And then we say, like Yolanda said a couple weeks ago, well, why not me? God is working in each one of you. The Holy Spirit lives in each one of you. You are his temple. You are his representative. Not by your own sufficiency, not by your own works and your own deeds, but by his grace. I'm speechless. Let that sink in. Moses went to the tent to meet with God. And he could only be with God for a little bit of time. And then he had to leave. We live in the presence of God. God lives in us. God is giving us a new heart, a heart of flesh. He's changing us. We're not the same people. You know, one of the most misquoted verses is Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Right? And who can know it? Then the next part says, but the Lord knows the heart. 
And Jeremiah then also talks about giving, God giving us a new heart. A heart that follows after God. Now, I always say you need to check to make sure what you're doing is aligned with what God has revealed in his word. But I would say that each one of you should not identify your heart as that one that is desperately wicked and who can know it because you've been given a new heart, a heart of flesh. You no longer have that heart of stone that is desperately wicked. You have a new heart. Now, there was a tension. There was an already not yet in the sense that that old heart still rails its ugly head. But that's not who you are. You are a new creation created in Christ Jesus, created for relationship, given a new heart. Who are you? A daughter of the king. Who are you? A son of the king. That's who you are. Holy, righteous, and redeemed. That's your identity. And Satan wants to make you think about that other identity. Satan wants to make you think of all the wrong things you've done. And even the wrong things that you did today or this morning or even right now in your own thoughts, he's bringing that to your mind. But that's not who you are. You are a child of the king. You're his ambassadors, and he has made you sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory, more glory, we have more glory than Moses because the glory of God dwells within us and is changing us and is transforming us. God's presence is with you every moment of every day and every moment of every day you are growing in the glory of God. You're becoming more like him. And as this outer tent, this outer man fades away, the inner man is being renewed all the more. For if there was a glory, verse 9, in the ministry of the condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, verse 10, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpassed it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more, <clears throat> excuse me, much more will what is permanent have glory. The law is being brought to an end in the sense that it is never what saves us. It was there as a schoolmaster to teach us, to show us that we needed God and that we couldn't ever fulfill it. We needed Christ's substitute on the cross. We needed the Holy Spirit to indwell us to empower us, to change us to the image of Christ. Not on our own sufficiency, but upon God's, who's with us every moment of every day. Verse 11, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more what is permanent have glory. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end so they, so they wouldn't see it fading. We don't have to be afraid of, of, of being outside the presence of God. We don't have to be afraid that God won't come through and minister for, through us. We can be bold because we know that the Holy Spirit lives within us and is empowering us to minister and is sufficient for that and not only sufficient to empower a minister, but is changing us. And in that very change, we are ministering. Think of your circles of influence. 
the people you know, the people you interact with. They're watching. You're a living epistle for them. What do they know about God from the way you live, from what you do, and how you speak? The Israelites, it says in 14, their minds were hardened for this day. When they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remained unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Christ is the only one that fulfills the law. Christ is the only one that can bring people to repentance. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Talking about the Israelites. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And with freedom comes responsibility. This concept in our culture that freedom means I do whatever I damn please is not freedom. That's not true freedom. True freedom is that I am free to act on behalf of man for their good. True freedom is that I act responsibly with my actions. And we all with unveiled faces Behold the glory of God. We don't want to put a veil over our faces. We don't want to hide what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus said, let your light shine before all men so that men might see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. We don't want to veil it. And we with unveiled Faces behold the glory of God, all being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord lives in you. The Spirit of the Lord is transforming you into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to the another. Tomorrow you'll be more glorified than you are today. God's glory will shine brighter through you. My challenge to you is to practice the presence of God. God is with you in this moment. And oftentimes to practice the presence of God, we have to practice the presence. Because God meets us where? In the present. And many of us fall into the trap of dwelling in the past or worrying about the future. But God meets you in the present. The present. In the very moment. We have to have a healthy outlook on the past and the future to live healthily in the present. The past does affect every single one of us. Choices I've made, choices I didn't make, circumstances that are outside of my control, that's all part of the past. And it affects my present I can have it drown me. I can have it cripple me. If I'm not trusting in the God who's with me. The God who's the creator of the universe, who's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-just. Is he a big enough God to take care of my past? Is he a big enough God to take care of your past? He is. And if he's a big enough God to take care of your past, then he's a big enough God to take care of your future. What if this happens? What if that happens? 
What if that happens? What if that happens? What? what, what? What if the stock market fails? What if, what if the, there's an early frost? What if, what if there's too much rain? What if I get in a car accident? What if Joella got in a car? She's not, she hasn't called me. Uh, she's late. Well, what, what, does she, is she dead in a ditch? What if? What if? We're all guilty of not recognizing God's presence presence in the present and trusting him there. We all are there. And the good news is that today God wants you to trust him in the present. That's all we have is this moment. We're not promised any more than that. And in this moment, we need to acknowledge and live in the presence of our Savior and every moment after this because He is trustworthy. He is good and He is gracious. And He is walking in the past and through the future And he's not calling you to be God. He's not calling you to take care of it and to solve those problems. He's calling you to relationship. He's calling you to trust in who he is and in what he's doing. Will you trust him today? Will you trust him with the past? Will you trust him with the present? And will you trust him with your future? Maybe you don't even know him. Well, today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. It's not difficult. It's not hard. It says if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, when you confess Jesus as Lord, that's saying Jesus is in charge. He's my boss. And when you do that, our relationship with God starts. The Holy Spirit fills you. He comes into you. He lives within you and you're living in the very presence of God. And day to day, you're growing in God's glory. Be encouraged, Christian. Be encouraged, brother. Be encouraged, sister. It's not on your own sufficiency. It's not on your own merit that this happens, but it's upon God's grace and God working in you. Just make him Lord. Humble yourself before him. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and we thank you that you are here. That you are in us. That there is nowhere we can go that you are not there. There is nowhere we can run and hide that you will not find us. We thank you that we are being transformed from glory to greater glory by your Spirit living in us, that we are your living epistles, that our glory does not fade but increases day by day as we live in relationship with you. And that relationship doesn't have to just happen on Sunday or Wednesday, but that relationship needs to happen in every moment of every day in the present. You've given us this moment. And the way we use each moment for relationship with you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with me to sing the last song.
this moment. We trust in you every day. For you hold all things together by the word of your power. For you showed us how much you love us and that you sent your only son to die on the cross for us. You are trustworthy. And may we cling to you in the midst of the circumstances that we find ourselves in knowing that you are present with us, growing us in your glory and conforming us to your image. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. I think there is some snack back there. I saw some chips. And-